that you can use to describe the work of the analyst in their indication. Whoever, they say, whoever works on analytic thinking takes up the task of a sentinel, a soldier or a guard whose job it is to keep watch for any new sign of danger. And the assistant, insistence on this was really important uh, because we're facing a situation right now where we have many analysts who base their reports on a constantly changing rate, who need to change their, who need to base their, their reports on a constantly changing reality, but instead um, what they do is kind of serve the role of priest, a doctor, and telling us what to do <coughs> for the wrong and judging. And, um, but as the Zapati says, uh, want to, they're proposing their argument that what they see is a reality that is worse than what we have planned or could even imagine, and so that might be a reason why it's so difficult to really address that reality. So it was also a call for our own vigilance and recognition that even as the sentinel who understands their role well can become overwhelmed in an ever-changing world, causing them to fall into what they, the Zapatistas, have noticed among their own ranks, uh, uh, fall into what they call the night watch syndrome where the sentinel reproduces the same image in a loop over and over again in their conscious perception, partly out of a desire to not disrupt an established routine. And so when analysts that we've long trusted in the role of sentinel continue to turn and report back on what capitalism is doing today, and they repeat what they've been saying 20 years before, 40 years before, 100 years before, the consequences for this for our struggle mean that we're not going to be able to maneuver and change our, our shift in tactics accordingly. And so it might even cause us to miss how cap capitalism itself transforms in response to our resistances and our rebellion. Mm -hmm. And it may even be possible to miss that rather than resisting capitalism, we may be reproducing capitalism. So for this, the Zapatistas have offered the image of the capitalist Hydra, which is a beast that generates a new head each time one of its old heads is attacked. A beast that can be destroyed not by focusing on its head, but by focusing on what it is that allows the beast itself to live. What is its air? What is its food? What is its habitat? And so then this question of capitalism possibly transforming then needs to lead us to grapple with basics. What do we mean when we talk about capitalism? And so. We often hear that it's not a thing, but it's a social relation. And so what I'd like to do here is offer you my working definition of capitalism because I feel like that's, that's how we should be having conversations. Um, and, it's, and it's a definition that I draw from Marx and from the black radical tradition and from feminist theory and from indigenous philosophy. And uh, I think that it's, it's one that I use when I, when I, I, I teach uh, political theory in public parks and living rooms. And so I kind of had to break it down to like a very basic understanding. So <coughs> here we go. To illustrate what I believe capitalism to mean, let's say I make pencils and you make paper. And one day we encounter each other with the idea of exchange. And if we were living in a different type of society, I may have already gifted you some of those pencils I made, and then a later day you may gift me some of the paper, but that's not capitalism. Capitalism does not operate under gifts. Capitalism operates under specific equivalences of exchange. So then what we end up doing is try to figure out, okay, how long did it take you to make your, your paper? Let's say, how long did it take you to make 10 sheets of paper? An hour. Okay, it took me an hour to make six pencils, so we trade. And so we'll pause right there just to notice some very key assumptions in that way that we're relating under capitalism. One is that we're relating to each other as equals, which we measure through the value of each other's labor time. Two, we're relating to each other as property owners. I am the property owner of the pencils I make. You are the property owner of the paper you make. Three, we're relating to each other in a consensual contractual relationship where once this exchange takes place, I'm not gonna call the cops on you and say that you accuse you of having stolen the, the pencils. Like it's, you will be the owner of those pencils and I of the paper. So these are really important relations that exist under capitalism, equality, property ownership, and, and mutual consent. 
it's worth looking, looking closely, though, at what exactly those mean under capitalism, because they might sound nice. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and, the, and the easiest way that I think we can critique that is by taking the perspective of who's not included in this relationship. What about the tree? The tree is necessary to make paper and to make pencils, but we, did we actually take into account the work that it does to create those materials that we use? And did we ask it for permission? And we can even take a step back from that question to, um, because I get, I've, I've gotten this before, well, Kiki, that's really not how capitalism works because you and I would not even have access to that tree. And yeah, likely we don't. Uh, Likely the way that we would see this unfold is that uh, we are not owners of anything. We don't have access to the tree. The only thing that we do own, however, is our labor power. And there's a capitalist out there now who owns the tree, the, the means of production. And so then what we do is we exchange our labor power for a wage, and then that capitalist sells the things that we produce by paying us less than what the capitalist makes out of that sale, surplus value. And so then there's the profit and then invest that profit to reproduce capitalism over and over and over again. <clears throat> but still, even under that scenario, we still have not taken into account the tree. Whether we own the means of production or a capitalist owns the means of production, we're still following a very, very important a uh, philosophical worldview of capitalism, and that is to divide the world into binary dualisms of superiority and inferiority, and in this case, we can talk about the human and the non-human, where it's human beings who have access to those rights of equality, property, ownership, contracts. But of course, as the black radical tradition shows us, not everyone who's actually homo sapien is considered a human. So within capitalism, there's always these contradictions in terms, so, and even in these relations. So, I mentioned that, what about the tree? Because if we were to even try to account for the, the work that the tree does, we wouldn't be able to really stop at the tree because what about the soil microbes? What about the water? What about the wind that pollinated that tree? Or the squirrel that hid the acorn and forgot about it and from it a tree sprouted? There's so much work that goes into creating the world and capitalism needs to not value a vast majority of it in this division over what is valued and what is not valued, over the human and the not human. So when we reduce our understanding of capitalism as a problem of unequal distribution, in our example that you and I as workers are not fully compensated for our labor, that we do not own the tree, and uh, we can gain profit from it, then we reproduce that fundamental division that privileges us above others. And so this, I think, can also speak to these battles of is it class, is it gender, is it race, is, it, it, is one derivative? It's, it's a similar logic fueling these superiorities, inferiorities, is an argument I'd like to propose. So we see that with uh, uh, workers doing, ex uh, doing the work of exploitation, that's a possible new head being created on this beast that is the capitalist hydra. Maybe not the dominant head, but a possible other head that then speaks more to our desires of the things that we've been told that we wanted. And we saw this, part of this in Standing Rock, uh, when many labor movements aligned with the, um, the pipeline creation because it would create jobs. And this is, of course, what happens when we're reduced to just being people who can, the only thing that we can do is sell our labor power. We, we need jobs, and so then we re that requires the destruction of Mother, of Mother Earth. And we see, though, that even among uh, indigenous movements, in Bolivia, for example, where the traditional enemy of indigenous communities and Mother Earth of La Pachamama has a European face, Mm -hmm. And in the United States, where it was once unimaginable that in a white supremacist society we could ever have a, a, a black face as head, capitalism through Evo Morales and Barack Obama was able not only to overcome resistance, but make itself more profound by incorporating the very movements who had once resisted it 
by appealing to desires who have among its heads somebody who quote looks like us. Olivia Ander Eva Morales, who continues Europe's extractivism of La Pachamama, was partly able to do so because few believed that an indigenous president would. Particularly when his discourse was precisely of defending La Pachamama. Focused on his actual policies of destroying the Amazon and uprooting its communities to allow the growth of agribusiness was the role of the sentinel. And while some paid close attention and were ringing the alarm bells, <coughs> others fell into the night watch syndrome for Evel's policies veered from the reality they wish they saw. It's easy to point and to report on Brazil Bolsonaro when he does it, burning the Amazon. But what does it mean for our analysis, after all, when an indigenous president acts like part of the oppressive class? That might be too much to bear for some people, and this is night watch syndrome. Mm -hmm. So here we should ask again, what do we mean by capitalism? Do we mean that we strive for equal opportunity with Europeans to raise and destroy Mother Earth? <laughs> do pipelines magically stop leaking because they're owned by indigenous people? In Mexico, we see another progressive government in the head of Andrés Manuel López Obrador, who almost exactly a year ago had a whole swearing-in ceremony <coughs> with the smudging and massive indigenous uh, symbolism everywhere, this huge production, asking Mother, he even asks so-called permission from Mother Earth to destroy her through his mega development project of the, the Maya train. He says that he's leading by obeying, which is a phrase that the Zapatistas and Evo Morales use that phrase as well. And so then it's, it's, it's incredibly confusing when, the dis, when, when this discourse is used, when this facade is used, and this is why we need to pay attention to reality, to what the actual policies are. With Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, he has a discourse against neoliberalism, which can, to me means that it's, let's get the Yankees or the Gringos or the foreigners out of here, and we get to reap the benefits of our national riches. So again, understanding Mother Earth as an object to be owned, and the Zapatistas, as, uh, who are completely in resistance against that, uh, and other indigenous movements like the Indigenous Governing Council, uh, are now by his supporters being called uh, agents of imperialism. So <clears throat> what do we mean then by uh, private versus public? Is that what we're focused on when we're talking about capitalism? Like, do we actually believe that for those of us who are prison abolitionists that the problem is privately owned prisons or that it's prisons? <laughs> in the United States, Barack Obama's policies were similarly ignored in the name of a different faith. Many assumed that because he was black, he would automatically never <coughs> oppress anybody because he knew what oppression was. <coughs> Others feared that critiquing the first black president would provide fuel to white supremacists, and that is a real fear. Others feared that they themselves would be called racist if they critiqued Barack Obama for his policies. And the effect that this had was to dismantle the anti-war movement that had grown mm -hmm. so strong yeah. under yeah. George yeah. Bush, yeah. allowing the US war machine to expand with a drone program, extrajudicial executions of US citizens, and the expulsion of one million more migrants, desperate migrants, trying to flee the death and destruction needed out by the United States and other capital, mm -hmm. global capitalism mm -hmm. on their country. Such is the work I hope that we see with Zionism, just to wrap up. Zionism has been incredibly productive for saving face of empire. When we critique Israel, for example, we have similar fears of being called anti-Semitic. We have similar fears of providing fuel to real anti-Semites. And what that does when this word just gets thrown around a racist and anti-Semite, it dilutes it completely. But it does real work. This confusion is incredibly productive for empire. And meanwhile, of course, Palestinians keep living their nightmare. Palestine keeps them disappearing. So in the face of resistance, we see here capitalism finds new legitimacy by growing new heads, heads of our desires. And then the question for us is how do you resist its seduction? And for this, to very briefly wrap up, we'll also need to have discussion about how do we understand the nature of the world? Is it just natural that we have divisions of superiority and inferiority? Some people believe that to be. I don't, maybe because I've had the honor of actually seeing worlds that don't operate that way. 
But I base that on reality again. I don't base that on what people have been telling me to think. So back to our task then as sentinels and the focus of reality, of the reality that we see rather than the reality that we are told to see or that we wish to see, being brave enough that no matter how frightening it might seem, if we confront reality before the storm hits us, before sounding the alarm once danger is present, and instead watching for those signs, evaluating them, interpreting them before the danger is present, sadly, while we have failed so many all over the world, and I think so much about Syria, those of us who are still here, we might at least stand a chance.